Section 17 of Rudder Grange. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Rudder Grange by Frank R. Stockton. Chapter 9. We Camp Out. My wife and I were both so fond of country life and country pursuits that month after month passed by at our little farm in a succession of delightful days. Time flew like a limited express train, and it was September before we knew it. I had been working very hard at the office that summer, and was glad to think of my two weeks' vacation, which were to begin on the first Monday of the month. I had intended spending these two weeks in rural retirement at home, but an interview in the city with my family physician caused me to change my mind. I told him my plan. Now, said he, if I were you, I'd do nothing of the kind. You have been working too hard. Your face shows it. You need rest and change. Nothing will do you so much good as to camp out. That will be fifty times better than going to any summer resort. You can take your wife with you. I know she'll like it. I don't care where you go, so that it's a healthy spot. Get a good tent and an outfit. Be off to the woods and forget all about business and domestic matters for a few weeks. This sounded splendid, and I propounded the plan to Euphemia that evening. She thought very well of it, and was sure we could do it. Pomona would not be afraid to remain in the house, under the protection of Lord Edward, and she could easily attend to the cow and the chickens. It would be a holiday for her, too. Old John, the man who occasionally worked for us, would come up sometimes and see after things. With her customary dexterity, Euphemia swept away every obstacle to the plan, and all was settled before we went to bed. As my wife had presumed, Pomona made no objections to remaining in charge of the house. The scheme pleased her greatly. So far, so good. I called that day on a friend who was in the habit of camping out to talk to him about getting a tent and the necessary traps for a life in the woods. He proved perfectly competent to furnish advice and everything else. He offered to lend me all I needed. He had a complete outfit, had done with them for the year, and I was perfectly welcome. Here was rare luck. He gave me a tent, camp stove, dishes, pots, gun, fishing tackle, a big canvas coat with dozens of pockets riveted on it, a canvas hat, rods, reels, boots that came up to my hips, and about a wagon load of things and all. He was a real good fellow. We laid in a stock of canned and condensed provisions, and I bought a book on camping out so as to be well posted on the subject. On the Saturday before the first Monday in September, we would have been entirely ready to start had we decided on the place where we were to go. We had found it very difficult to make this decision. There were thousands of places where people went to camp out, but none of them seemed to be the place for us. Most of them were too far away. We figured up the cost of taking ourselves and our camp equipage to the Adirondacks, the lakes, the trout streams of Maine, or any of those well-known resorts, and we found that we could not afford such trips, especially for a vacation of but fourteen days. On Sunday afternoon we took a little walk. Our minds were still troubled about the spot toward which we ought to journey next day, and we needed the soothing influence of nature. The country to the north and west of our little farm was very beautiful. About half a mile from the house a modest river ran. On each side of it were grass-covered fields and hills, and in some places there were extensive tracts of woodlands. "'Look here!' exclaimed Euphemia, stopping short in the little path that wound along by the river bank. "'Do you see this river, those woods, those beautiful fields, with not a soul in them or anywhere near them, and those lovely blue mountains over there?' As she spoke she waved her parasol in the direction of the objects indicated, and I could not mistake them. "'Now what could we want better than this?' she continued. Here we can fish and do everything that we want to do. I say, let us camp here on our own river. I can take you to the very spot for the tent. Come on. And she was so excited about it that she fairly ran. The spot she pointed out was the one we had frequently visited on our rural walks. It was a grassy peninsula, as I termed it, formed by a sudden turn of the creek which, a short distance below, flowed into the river. It was a very secluded spot. The place was approached through a pasture field, we had found it by mere accident, and where the peninsula joined the field, we had to climb a fence just there, there was a cluster of chestnut and hickory trees, while down near the point stood a wide-spreading oak. 
Here, under this oak, is the place for the tent, said Euphemia, her face flushed, her eyes sparkling, and her dress a little torn by getting over the fence in a hurry. What do we want with your Adirondacks and your dismal swamps? This is the place for us. Euphemia, said I, in as composed a tone as possible, although my whole frame was trembling with emotion, Euphemia, I am glad I married you. Had it not been Sunday, we would have set up our tent that night. Early the next morning, old John's fifteen-dollar horse drew from our house a wagon-load of camp fixtures. There was some difficulty in getting the wagon over the field, and there were fences to be taken down to allow of its passage, but we overcame all obstacles, and reached the campground without breaking so much as a teacup. Old John helped me to pitch the tent, and as neither of us understood the matter very well, it took us some time. It was, indeed, nearly noon when old John left us, and it may have been possible that he delayed matters a little so as to be able to charge for a full half-day for himself and horse. Euphemia got into the wagon to ride back with him, that she might give some parting injunctions to Pomona. "'I'll have to stop a bit to put up the fences, ma'am,' said old John, "'or Mr. Ball might make a fuss. "'Is this Mr. Ball's land?' I asked. "'Oh, yes, sir, it's Mr. Ball's land. "'I wonder how he'll like our camping on it,' I said, thoughtfully. "'I'd a thought, sir, you'd a asked him before you came,' said old John, "'in a tone that seemed to indicate that he had his doubts about Mr. Ball. "'Oh, there'll be no trouble about that,' cried Euphemia. "'You can drive me past Mr. Ball's. "'It's not much out of the way, and I'll ask him.' "'In that wagon,' said I, "'will you stop at Mr. Ball's door in that?' Certainly, said she, as she arranged herself on the board which served as a seat. Now that our campaign has really commenced, we ought to begin to rough it, and should not be too proud to ride even in a... in a... she evidently couldn't think of any vehicle mean enough for her purpose. In a green grocery cart, I suggested. Yes, or in a red one. Go ahead, John. When Euphemia returned on foot, I had a fire in the camp stove and the kettle was on. Well, said Euphemia, Mr. Ball says it's all right, if we keep the fence up. He don't want his cows to get into the creek, and I'm sure we don't want him walking over us. He couldn't understand, though, why we wanted to live out here. I explained the whole thing to him very carefully, but it didn't seem to make much impression on him. I believe he thinks Pomona has something the matter with her, and that we have come to stay out here in the fresh air so as not to take it. What an extremely stupid man Mr. Ball must be, I said. The fire did not burn very well, and while I was at work at it, Euphemia spread a cloth upon the grass, and set forth bread and butter, cheese, sardines, potted ham, preserves, biscuits, and a lot of other things. We did not wait for the kettle to boil, but concluded to do without tea or coffee for this meal, and content ourselves with pure water. For some reason or other, however, the creek water did not seem to be very pure, and we did not like it a bit. After lunch, said I, we will go and look for a spring, that will be a good way of exploring the country. If we can't find one, said Euphemia, we shall have to go to the house for water, for I can never drink that stuff. Soon after lunch we started out. We searched high and low, near and far, for a spring, but could not find one. At length, by merest accident, we found ourselves in the vicinity of old John's little house. I knew he had a good well, and so we went in to get a drink, for our ham and biscuits had made us very thirsty. We told old John, who was digging potatoes, and who was also very much surprised to see us so soon, about our unexpected trouble in finding a spring. No, said he very slowly, there is no spring very near to you. Didn't you tell your gal to bring you water? No, I replied. We don't want her coming down to the camp. She is to attend to the house. Oh, very well, said John. I will bring you water, morning and night, good fresh water, from my well, for, well, for ten cents a day. That will be nice, said Euphemia, and cheap, too. And then it will be well to have John come every day. He can carry our letters. I don't expect to write any letters. Neither do I, said Euphemia, but it will be pleasant to have some communication with the outer world. So we engaged old John to bring us water twice a day. I was a little disappointed at this, for I thought that camping on the edge of a stream settled the matter of water. But we have many things to learn in this world. Early in the afternoon I went out to catch some fish for supper. We agreed to dispense with dinner and have breakfast, lunch, and a good solid supper. For some time I had poor luck. There were either very few fish in the creek or they were not hungry. I had been fishing an hour or more when I saw Euphemia running toward me. "'What's the matter?' said I. "'Oh, nothing. 
I've just come to see how you were getting along. Haven't you been gone an awfully long time? And are those all the fish you've caught? What little bits of things they are. I thought people who camped out caught big fish and lots of them. That depends a good deal upon where they go, said I. Yes, I suppose so, replied Euphemia. But I should think a stream as big as this would have plenty of fish in it. However, if you can't catch any, you might go up the road and watch for Mr. Mulligan. He sometimes comes along on Mondays. I am not going to the road to watch for any fish man, I replied, a little more testily than I should have spoken. What sort of a camping out would that be? But we must not be talking here, or I shall never get a bite. Those fish are a little soiled from jumping about in the dust. You might wash them off at that shallow place while I go a little further on and try my luck. End of section 17